All right, I believe that we have started here. I'm gonna start it recording now. Um, so give me just a few minutes here to kind of get my thoughts together and put out some social media posts. We're gonna be talking for about an hour roughly um, about books, publishing in 2020, um, 2022, I'm sorry, why you would wanna do a, such a thing like that and um, what the written word and spoken word means uh, moving forward in the digital era. So that's some pretty heavy topics there, uh, but I, I think that you can all handle it. So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, go by this outline that I've actually uh, prepared for us today, and we're gonna talk about um, my previous work and my upcoming work and probably some of my buddies work as well um, some of the hurdles that I'm having uh, moving my sort of web 2.0 version into uh, web whatever version of the web we're on right now so uh, let me send out some social media links and we'll get started Okay, I believe that has been completed. Uh, I don't have Twitter hooked up onto this, so that's not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, let's give it another minute to see if anything comes up in the stream health and stream settings. Um, everything's looking pretty good in OBS. Everything's looking pretty good on the audio monitoring. Uh, do let me know if anything gets a little too quiet. I'm going to crank up the gain on this thing just a little. Okay. So, like I said, we have an outline. Uh, but first, let me grab some stuff here. In case anyone didn't know this, um, I am an author and a publisher. And I sort of began this journey sometime in 2006, seven, eight is when I started putting together my first manuscripts. And I self-published in 2010 after forming a company called The New Scum Productions. And The New Scum Productions still holds the copyrights on my first three books. And Elmblad Media Group holds the copyrights on my two photo books or photo essays, however you'd like to refer to them. I don't have copies of those with me, but I do have um, hardcover and paperback copies of um, my actual like written books, like my novels. And so let me grab those real quick. Um, the first one that I published is Whatever Happens Happens, a true story about coming to grips with reality. And this is some pretty cheesy like 22-year-old guy stuff. And I got to be honest with you, um, you know, reading back through some of this stuff is pretty painful and not in a like, oh, I, I screwed up my life type of way, but in a like, hey, man, like you had some pretty twisted ideas about reality and what like relationships with people were supposed to be like. So um, we're going to be talking about that as well. Um, and on that topic, we also I'm sure that was pretty loud. I apologize. Uh, on that topic, we also have A New Way Home. Um, you can see that jolly cover right there. Um, and this was my second book. And it, it was kind of rushed a little bit. I did have a couple of editors help me look at it, but it wasn't nearly as refined of a text, so to speak, as uh, Whatever Happens Happens was. Um, this one, uh, previously, I hadn't really been proud of it, really. And um, I just wanted to... Um, really 
kind of go back through it at some point before I read an audio book and really not necessarily clean it up for language, but clarify the content a little bit and talk about why I was feeling the way I was feeling and what all of this stuff is supposed to represent. Because I feel like a lot of the ideas that I put forth in this book kind of like died out there in the void um, a long time ago, and they're really not applicable in the modern age. So the uh, f most recent book that I wrote is the one that I'm actually like proud of selling and like I talk it up and I'm happy to have people refer to this and that is Borderline Vagabond. Um, and Borderline Vagabond is kind of the primary uh, vehicle for my ideas that exists out in the public sphere. Um, I'm really proud of this thing. It took forever to get it accomplished and um, the story is, is pretty intense. Uh, but even that being said, um, I, the content is pretty ra it's pretty spicy and and I just don't know if that's really how I want to extend my reach out into the world at large. So um, I'm writing another book called Normal on Trial. And we're gonna crack into that a little bit today. Um, it's it's gonna be a little while before we get to that. But um, now that we've talked about my previous work, um, let's get right into the outline that I've prepared. And so my question to you and to myself and to um, the future and the viewing public, that's definitely not <laughs> viewing this right now, but will be potentially in the future. Um, why write a book in 2022? And so here is my like thesis on, on this whole thing. Um, communication happens through words and language, right? So the communication of ideas is going to persist without regard to how we decide to contain it. And I think when we say, why write a book in 2022? I I think we're burying the lead a little bit. And I think the real question to ask is, what is a book and what is writing in 2022? And I think that uh, the obvious answer to that question in the digital frame is, um, you know, a, an incorporation of social media and podcasting and audio content and continuous content and video content and streaming content such as this. Um, it's sort of a holistic um, brand representation ideology, so to speak. That's all right, cool. We got some random text here coming from random YouTube bots, I guess. Um, that's fine. Hello in the chat if that means something. Um, Anyway, uh, so th the idea, what is a book, is sort of like, imagine if um, you were a touring band like Fish, and you recorded your concerts, right? Like, that's a separate piece of content from the original albums, and I, I think Fish is a poor analogy because I don't know them that well, and I'm assuming they don't have that many studio records, as I recall. But anyway... Uh, what what is your content? You have different sort of veins of content as a as an author and as a writer. You could take the standard publishing route, meaning you're gonna publish books to sell in bookstores and on on um, that dirty rotten place that we all buy and sell books on, um, or you're gonna sell them through your own por portal, your own website. Um, you're going to go to trade shows and meetings and these types of things and sell them in the back of venues, like sell them out of the back of your car. Um, there's a lot of options to us as authors in what we could call the like digital future that we exist in. Right. And so um, my idea here is uh, since I interact with a lot of authors for a number of reasons, um, I, I kind of want to pose the question, you know, why are we continuing to do what we do uh, moving forward? And if we are going to continue doing what we're doing moving forward, how can we better engage our audience? How can we better um, 
write? How can we how can we be more socially conscious with our writing? How can we um, represent the human condition in a fair and representative way, but not in a way that offends or disgusts or risks um, uh, from an economics perspective, like alienating part of our audience? So uh, if if we want to write original thought-provoking content that is just controversial enough to um, inspire th critical thinking, but not controversial enough to offend and alienate, um, we're going to be towing a really fine line um, on, on from a free speech perspective. And so my work kind of dances along that fine line because a lot of my language is actually pretty abrasive. And when I was 25 going on 30, I thought that was uh, an edgy way to communicate and, and a way that sort of um, conveyed the thought that, that I might be, um, you know, cooler or... or um, M more more into the world or more worldly in general than anybody else and the truth is I wasn't and am not and and so I think uh, in terms of my writing we're going to be pursuing a much more honest approach uh, in in my next book which is called normal on trial and anyone who's been following my career has been hearing me talk about normal on trial nonstop. Uh, I began the manuscript in 2014 and it's been notes forever um, it now exists as a 158 page document as well as this uh, binder of notes and so this is another thing I wanted to talk about in terms of um, pr uh, the writing process itself I actually have um, behind me all of my old notebooks from the previous books that I wrote struggling here apparently so this is audiobook reading copies of um, whatever happens happens and this is long before we could put them all up on the internet and just get them um, you know I had to bring all of these manuscripts to Kinko's and get them printed overnight I'd be in there red-eyed from espresso and God knows what else I was intaking at the time and um, you know just red penning the thing and that's how we edited we went to coffee shops at three o'clock in the morning and we crossed things out with red pens and we like frantically and frenetically like investigated our deepest thoughts and philosophies waxed poetically about our like suburban um lives <laughs> But we also did a lot of really cool traveling, and we also did a lot of um, interesting and thought-provoking conversating and dialectic um, that, uh, in a way, got preserved in some of my writing. So I don't think it's wholly bad. I think it's just a little bad. And I think that over the process of the next couple of weeks and months, I really want to examine these texts um, think about what we could do better in the future and think about um, what I might want to do to do kind of like an annotated apology text or like explanation text kind of in the way where like you could you could get a text of a, like a book of the Bible that has been annotated by scholars like I want to annotate my own work and be like listen man this is not the way um, and I don't want to I don't want to damage my text or or take my text um, out of its own context. So it'd be a really interesting way to approach an anniversary edition. Um, uh, there's a number of problems with doing that, and I guess maybe we'll get into that later. But I don't want to be too long here. I just kind of want to go through these past works r real quick and um, sort of talk about what I mean when I say the text is sort of amateurish. So do bear with me for a moment as I kind of change things around here. I'm going to take me off. And this is 
um, a little thing that I've prepared here. So I was thinking, man, maybe let's just read a little bit from each one of these books and, and we'll kind of get an idea of, of where we're at here. So I've got my direct monitor headphones on here and we'll get my best announcer voice and we'll we'll just read through this stuff because eventually what I want to do is talk about um, audiobooks and and publishing so this is uh, something that we're going to be doing fairly frequently over the next couple of weeks uh, let's dig in so this is my first book that I published um, in oh god I think it was 2010 but let's double check here of course I didn't put it on the back it ought to be in the front um, 2010. Yep. Sometimes my memory serves me correctly. All right. So this is chapter one, Genesis. Um, I had little quotes here. Uh, I did Alice Cooper. I'm 18. I've got to get away. Um, I find there's a beginning and an end to every story. Life is nothing but a bunch of stories. Some stories last longer than others. Some stories don't last long at all. Some stories occur in series, some follow a genre. Some stories are sad, others happy. Some stories are never told, most of them come out eventually. Sometimes we forget stories. Sometimes we try to forget stories. Everyone gets the story a bit different, and everyone's stories are mixed together. There can even be stories within stories. I look at things like I look at history. Everything you know is part of what we know, and it's always up for a reappraisal, rethinking what actually happened. It's up for interpretation. As time passes by, things start to become a bit more clear. Pieces start to fit together. Everyone's stories start looking the same. Large groups of people all over the world with all sorts of stories to tell. Large groups of people all over the world ready to listen to them. This is the beginning of my story about growing up. This is when I started writing that journal that we all keep in the rarest trodden depths of our minds, the journal of life. This is when I woke up, eyes widened, and said, oh shit, here it comes. Maybe I was ready, maybe I wasn't. My story begins in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and it ends there too, just to let you know from the beginning. This story does not have a happy ending. Did you ever read the Iliad? You know, the one written by Homer, as in ancient Greece, not the Simpsons. Well, if you haven't, it's kind of set smack dab in the middle of the Trojan War. A bunch of stuff has already happened and a bunch of stuff has yet to happen. We just see a small snapshot of time, mostly about a guy named Achilles. His girlfriend gets taken away by his buddy and he gets pretty pissed about it. He sits at home and stews for a while and then he chooses to meet his fate. I am Achilles. This story will take you around the earth and to the depth depths of humanity's plight. I am not really Achilles because I don't have nearly the glory of our hero, but it's convenient to draw some parallels. I like to do that. This is my epic poem. Not to mention the obvi obvious lack of dactylic hexameter. I've always found poetry to be a constrained and pretentious way of expressing yourself and your ideas. Meter and structure is only a limitation. For a while there, I got really into Buddhism. I meditated every morning, after school, and every night. I worked out, I ate healthy, I knew my body. Every muscle, every artery, I could feel it all. I did Tai Chi and Kung Fu, and I read every book about Zen cultivation I could get my mitts on. I wanted to be at peace. I wanted to grow up and become a man. I was alive, and I was totally in control. I knew where I was going to be at any minute of any given day, and it was great. I thought about taking a couple of months off at a Buddhist monastery in Illinois or something, but decided against it because I thought my Catholic family would freak out. People used to say to me, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. I've never been a fan of absolute permanency either. And so we'll end it there. So that's a little bit of reading from Whatever Happens Happens, this book. And 
uh, it's kind of an, an example. Like, m- my writing's not terrible, you know. If if I was a publisher and I received this uh, as a submission, I would definitely be interested in in finding out what the rest of this story was. It's captivating enough to keep attention, but that attention is for a 2010 audience. That uh, that attention isn't really for um, a newer generation of lead of leaders, readers, and content viewers and consumers or content creators for that matter either so um moving forward let's talk briefly about a new way home and so this book came out really really quickly after um whatever happens happens because i had kind of been sitting on both of these manuscripts and once i realized i could write books i wanted to get this next one out right away so i actually published this one the same year as whatever happens happens which is probably why this one never really got as much traction as that one did um also the the story is a a lot different and it kind of uh you sort of have to know what you don't have to know anything to read any book obviously but um i i was really influenced by the beat generation so if you don't have some sort of baseline knowledge of that period in a, in the history of American literature, you might be kind of lost reading material such as mine. So um, let's go ahead and go back to the view of my computer, and we're going to go to A New Way Home. So this is some like flowery, weird, apocalyptic crap that, that I wrote about a dream that I had. And um, this is never before uh, read material. This is never before published um, on YouTube or anything like that. So this is when we're diving into new stuff here. So chapter eight, let's all go to the apocalypse. So I had this dream. One of those dreams you can't forget when you wake up. The dreams that seem to permeate your waking mind for days and days after it occurs. The kind of dream that would cause some guy named John to write the book of Revelation. The kind of dream that you can't easily write off as a figment of your overactive imagination. The kind of dream that seems as if you're telling yourself something. Telling yourself something. It was another dream in a long stream of reoccurring dreams set in a large city, seemingly in the present. During these dreams, I would travel from my apartment to various destinations, usually accompanied by real-life friends. We would encounter normal things, nothing out of the realm of real-world possibility. Bums on the street, a swanky uptown bar, a shopping mall, maybe a nice stroll in a dream city parking. (laughs) I was going to say parking lot. In a dream city park. Except for the one I dreamed of Barack Obama as a lounge singer belting out, I'm the Slime by Frank Zappa. That was a bit wild. He did a pretty good job. This dream, while beginning in the same city the others did, took a bizarre turn for the downright apocalyptic. I found myself in a new part of the now familiar city. This time around, a dimly lit bar inside an airport gate. This is obviously a special, privately owned gate because it has a distinct Hunter's Lodge feel. Looking out the window, I can see a long sea of pavement where the airplanes are taxied down runways with a cityscape backdrop of high-rises and smog. There is ancient-looking stained wood paneling on the walls and various sporting man memorabilia, much like a theme restaurant. There's antique fly fishing rods and bolt-action rifles mounted near taxidermies of an impressive array of wild beast and fish. I'm sitting at a circular wooden table with five other people in black hoods. We all drink gin from wooden cups. I can taste the juniper. I feel the familiar warmth of it flowing down my throat. I have an eerie sense of perception in this dream world now, as I am familiar with it and comfortable in it, even while in a dream state. I ask one of the hooded figures where we're headed. One turns toward me face shrouded by a shadowy black veil, who calmly mutters, Belize, in a low but oddly reassuring whisper. I look past him through the window to see a 1930s-era prop plane 
with what seemed like yellowing canvas wings and an ancient engines sputtering thick black smoke. We all silently stand and file out the doorway to the tarmac where we are motioned by airport personnel to climb the staircase to the airplane. At the base of the staircase, we meet the pilot, none other than Teddy Roosevelt, 26th president of the United States, long since dead. I know by now that I am in for a hell of an adventure. He's not wearing a black cloak like us. He's dressed in a three-piece suit and monocle, looking eerily similar to the Monopoly man. After a long, bumpy ride low to the ground, which magically lasted a short time in my dream world, we landed in a grassy airstrip far away from any cityscape or natural feature I'm familiar with, though the terrain is obviously earthen. I'm used to having strange dreams, and I've always taken extra care in noticing details so as to broaden the experience. After getting out of the airplane, we walk a few hundred feet down a dirt trail to a horse stable, where we are told by Teddy to mount and ride as we begin a single file descent on a dirt trail to the lush river valley. There are wild flowers and long grasses growing everywhere in this stunningly beautiful tract of land. We follow the river to a delta, presumably now in Belize, where we are introduced to a small, dark-skinned, Spanish-speaking man named Pietro, who motions toward a small, rackety-looking boat with a seemingly underpowered outboard motor. Teddy politely takes his leave with a graceful bow and tipping of the hat. The figures and I board the boat as Pietro sets off to sea from the river delta, following close to shore. We bear south with rocky sandstone cliffs jutting up on our right side. The boat, although sadly underpowered, makes its way slowly down the coast. Off in the distance, I can see a canyon materialize from the fog on the horizon that seems to be cut straight down by a narrow river. We turn, in, we turn into the river, sailing down a corridor of sheer cliffs rising up at least 300 feet in the air. The river flows into a small circular pool, also surrounded by sheer cliff faces, with a small sandy beach opening into a cave on the far side of the circle. Over the mouth of the cave flows a raging waterfall, falling from the height of the rock, uh, of the rock faces around us. I found myself wishing inside my dream that it wasn't a dream, so I could take advantage of such a picturesque scene. So, that's uh, the flowery prose of A New Way Home. And, you know, that's a part of that book that I'm actually fairly... Um, happy with and that I'm I actually really like but you'll see when we actually get into this that it's not that <laughs> not that cool all around is a cohesive kind of story and so although there are parts such as this chapter that are really excellent um, overall it's it's just not really what I want to represent my ideas in the world so um, I'm gonna kind of summing up behind the scenes the part of borderline vagabond that i want to read because i sort of changed my mind um as we were going on uh today oh something's out of memory that's wonderful let's uh get rid of these others um i think this is the chapter very close to it anyway um oh, okay now i found it so um, Borderline Vagabond, I published in uh, 2014. Yeah, 2014. So there was a four year gap between my first two books and my next book. So when I published it in 2014, I began writing the manuscript for what would become Normal on Trial. And it is now 2022, a full eight years later. And I still have not completed that manuscript. So that's part of what this series of videos is going to try to tackle, getting that manuscript completed. But in order to have full context for that, we're going to need to talk about all the um, past material. So um, let's dive into a little bit of Borderline Vagabond a little bit. And um, this is kind of where it's probably going to start getting um, pretty vulgar. So um, 
let's get into this. Um, I'll switch over here in a second once I finally got to the point where I want to be. Oh, this is a description of um, an interaction between two characters. This is pretty late on in the book. Um, I have performed this on YouTube before, um, but it was a long time ago, and that got rejected by Audible, so the um, audiobook version of Borderline Vagabond never actually happened, and that's another uh, mission that I want to accomplish uh, with with this ongoing series. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and change this view once again. And we're going to be back at Borderline Vagabond, Chapter 12, Lucidity. So what is this? What do you want from me? Where do we go from here? She said as we walked out of the pancake house. I don't want anything from you, I said facing forward. I said it calmly and honestly. Maybe I thought I was being cool. I really don't know why I say certain things. This scene could play out like a trashy made-for-television movie. Dramatic camera angles and hard cuts from my face to hers as I continued to say stupid things. Oh, she seemed let down. She exhaled deeply, put her hands in her pockets, and stared at the ground. I thought it had been the right thing to say. I'm never good at these things. In this movie, I was supposed to be the mysterious vagabond, the man that left as quickly as he had arrived. I was just happy to be inside the moment, taking hold of the main nerve. It was all symbolic to me, all about living life and nothing about real world consequences, much less the feelings of other people. I just always had to assume that if I was having a good time, so was everyone else. We're all in this together, but we can't read, e we can't read other people's minds. She broke the silence. I don't know how you could say something like that. She mocked me. I don't want anything from you. Are you a human being? I... What? My face fell and I fouled all pretense of being the mysterious stranger. I should have never been acting like someone else in the first place. What do you do? Just go around stomping on people's feelings all day? Fuck them and leave? Is it nothing but insults and cold indifference with you? She hunched over and pointed at me, accusingly. Jesus, I thought. Here comes the inevitable sadness. Where's this coming from? I didn't mean to be cold. I just mean that I don't want anything from you. I'm just happy to be here. No requirements. I don't mean any offense. I think you may have misunderstood me. I put my arms up in protest. No requirements? How can you say that? The man with such big ideals and goals. Not going to ask me out for drinks? Your buddy is going to go home and sleep off a long night. What are you going to do before you head home? You said you have another day, right? Oh, I'd been had. I smiled. Where to, Jazz? Anywhere that has booze. Want to get some liquor and bum around town? Maybe hit the bar and make fun of some people? Your call. I feel like drinking a pint of whiskey and putting my feet in some water. Know a good place? I know a perfect place. Let's get some booze and head out. I'll give you directions as we go. We got in the car and headed to the liquor store and found a cheap pint of whiskey and some ginger ale. After picking up my car at Hooper's, Jasmine led me to a small picnic area on a stream outside Durham where we mixed some drinks in empty water bottles. In empty water bottles. I like to come down here and think sometimes, Jasmine said, getting out of the car. She stretched as she spoke, bringing her arms out to her sides throwing her head back, letting her orange hair fall free and gently float in the wind. She really was beautiful. I still couldn't quite believe all of this was happening. When life takes its strange turns, all you can do is stare at the surroundings and try to remember everything you can. You never know what might be important some other time. Seems like a good place to think, I said, 
taking a small sip of whiskey and walking in the general direction of the stream. Let's go for a walk. She caught up with me and grabbed my hand, matching my pace and slowly swinging her arm. Sounds nice. We walked down a path into the woods, following, a, following the small stream leading to a lake. There was a green painted wrought iron bench near the bank off the stream, and we sat down on it. I love nature, she said. The birds and the water and the trees and stuff. I wish I did this kind of thing more often. Yeah, me too. I've done a fair share of eco-tourism in my day. There's a lot of good <laughs> there's a lot of good-looking land around here. It sounds like you've done an awful lot. I kind of wish I had done more than just move out here and go to college. We write our own stories, you know. My life hasn't been as glamorous as I make it out to be. I mean, I've done everything I said I've done, but there's always some really shitty parts between the awesome parts. I try to only talk about the awesome parts. What do you mean by shitty? Eh, all the stuff that's part of life, you know. Being broke, getting rejected by chicks and literary agents, puking in strangers' toilets, friends dying, struggles with addiction, depression, health issues, all of it. I just try not to dwell on it. I try to remain in constant forward progression. Yeah, I guess nobody's life is perfect. She sat down on a picnic table near the edge of the water. She grabbed her legs, pulling them close to her body. She rested her chin on her knees, staring out at the lake. I sat down behind her on the table, resting my hands on her shoulders. The sky was exceptionally clear that day. Everything just seemed so vibrant and alive. The way we see and interpret the world around us is affected by our mood. When everything around you seems to be crashing down all the time, it's hard to look up and see anything but a shitstorm on the horizon. That day, everything seemed so inspiring. The blue of the sky was so deep and expansive, the clouds so perfectly rounded and randomly distributed like tiny cotton balls glued up there by a toddler at summer camp. The sun hung like an ornament, perspective diminishing its raging nuclear fury to a paltry drop of lemon meringue among the cotton. I rubbed her shoulders slowly. She laid her head on my thigh. I wanted to leave with this moment forever etched in my memory, like many I had experienced on this trip south. I could have stayed there in North Carolina easily at that moment in my life. I could have found a job like Chad's, and I could have crashed at Hooper's place until I got, an, until I got my feet on the ground. I could have carved out a new path through life with Jasmine in a new place far away from the mitt and the snowstorms in the past. I could find new friends and start everything over could save up some cash, break my lease and sell all my music equipment back home, bring it all to a pawn shop and get a check for a quarter of what it was worth. What are you thinking about? She said. And so that's Borderline Vagabond. <laughs> and so I think you'll see um, this evolution of writing is much more authentic to my voice, uh, much more descriptive of what's happening. Um, the characters are much more believable. Uh, the narrative is much less static and rigid and weird and seemingly written by a kid who doesn't know how to write. Um, so maybe you'll understand now why I uh, like Borderline Vagabond a lot, <laughs> a lot more than the other two books. So Borderline Vagabond is probably the first audiobook that we'll record on stream uh, with the intent of publishing it on Audible. And so we're going to talk about how all that stuff works and about uh, how a self-publisher might get their content on Audible either being read by them themselves or by someone else. So that's going to be um, pretty valuable information or, or at least something fun to play along with at home. So if you uh, like that idea of something like that happening make sure you follow along give a comment a like a subscribe type thing any anything helps um commenting on the live streams is going to help a whole lot so even after the fact like when this is published on youtube later um do feel free to just like make a comment and like it um uh 
likes that happen during the stream are more valuable in terms of the algorithm. So anyway, no one gives a crap about any of that stuff. Um, let's talk about normal on trial. So this is the good stuff. This is the new stuff. This is what's coming down the pipeline. So um, this manuscript is not completed. In fact, according to my measurements, it's 11.6% completed. And um, I sort of base that on this handy completion chart that I have uh, made for myself here. And so there's 20 chapters in normal on trial according to the outline. And those 20 chapters are divided into four stages. Those stages are larval, chrysalis, imag imago, and gnosis. Um, gnosis is another way to pronounce that word, and imago, or, um, you know, these are Latin, like, etymological, etymological terms, uh, entomological terms, uh, r making reference, um, the first three anyway, to um, the stages of development of a butterfly. So that is the reference there. Um, that's why I'm doing such, like, weird stuff. So I'll read you a little bit of Normal on Trial, and this is the first time I've read Normal on Trial to literally anybody, so let's crack open another computer here and open up my document. And so I think what we're going to do is we're not going to read any of the actual text. We're going to read a couple of things. Uh, we're going to read my uh, dedication at the beginning. It's kind of like a charge, like, a, like just a feel-good thing that I've written before the actual text begins. So let me readjust myself here just a little bit. Um, I shall carry ye close to my heart, O absent friends and lost lovers. You shall be the wind that lifts, the fire that tempers, the water that heals, and the land that provides. I will step into the unknown without fear in the ever-present awareness of the continuity of your spirit through the memories of those you lend strength. I will hold myself accountable to these truths and seek to live in balance and clarity of purpose. That balance will be found through the detachment from frivolous desires, and that purpose will be to continue the search for knowledge Val valuable experience and in service to the arts and their muses. I will continue to march forward in my efforts and I will continue to keep sacred the processes of discovery and the reflection upon self and goal. I will dedicate the entire effort of my purpose to the ends of freeing my own spirit from the confines of regret, economic servitude, and feelings of inadequacy. I affirm that my ideals are honest, my intentions are pure, and that I can serve the greater good by providing a source of stability for weary travelers on this spaceship Earth and be a good example to those that are watching and looking for examples and be a good person that does what he promises to do and means what he says at face value. I will not know fear in the land of milk and honey nor want in the land of ice and snow. I will take only what I need from the world and not a shred more. I will live in harmony with the world I found myself in and preserve that harmony through the hard work required to give back in greater measure to what I have received here. So that's my charge. <laughs> uh, pretty heady stuff at the beginning of a book, eh? Um, yeah, that's, that's before the table of contents. So that kind of sets the tone for what I'm looking to achieve with normal on trial. Um, if someone was going to call normal on trial my, like, <sighs> epic novel, uh, that's certainly what I intend it to be. So um, let's read a little bit of the preamble here, um, just because I'm, I'm enjoying the feeling of getting words out, and we don't have much engagement here um, on YouTube. Um, as a matter of fact, let me just see if anybody is noodling around on Facebook. A um, little bit of engagement. Let's see. Yeah, we got some people talking and looking. Um, yeah, we're good to go here. Uh, how are we looking on time? We're at 
45 minute mark roughly that's cool let's keep rocking um i'll just keep going till five and then um you know if anybody gets a chance to catch this this evening do give me a comment and i'll see it on my phone and stuff just let me know that the audio is working and the video changes are happening in a reasonable amount of time and um hopefully everything's hunky-dory so this is the preamble from normal on trial and this is fairly polished um the published version will probably differ from this and we're not going to read the whole thing but um this is the the first couple of pages of it uh from what i have right now at the end of january 2022 so uh preamble so we're going to preface this whole thing with a preface just because we like organization as much as we like setting the tone all good we're going to call it a preamble, though. It just sounds cooler when you write that. Think you're ready for this? Listen. Human beings are notoriously lazy, fickle to a fault, untrustworthy in aggregate, and unreliable at the best of times. Towards both themselves and towards those that they purport themselves to care about. Every one of them will let you down at some point, even the ones you thought never would. There is no help coming. There is no dim light on the horizon to guide you back home. No magic answer to all the questions you've been having lately. Even in the company of others, you are utterly alone in your thoughts and dreams and wishes. There is no song playing in the background for the casualties of life's way. The world at large is completely indifferent to your suffering, and you must learn to find that guiding light inside your own mind. You alone can guide your path. You alone are responsible for your own happiness and success. You alone are responsible for what goes into and comes out of your body and when and where. There is no manual to consult, no tried and true method to follow. You can only work to find the truth and reality as it pertains to you. You, alone. That being said, let's broaden this you to we. Here we go. We've been fed a long line of lives, <laughs> a long line of lies for our entire lives, right? You feel this way too? Lies from the television, lies from the internet, lies about our lives on social media, and lies about the world at large from just about everyone in it at large lies about what happened where when who knows who cares and who lives to lie about it lies about who you should listen to coming from those you shouldn't be listening to lies about what's right and what's wrong or even about the meaning of those two words lies about how you should live your life about what your goals should be and about how to live together peacefully in this modern world of information exchange and infinitely variable gray areas of verisimilitude. The whole thing is just a great big lie, one tremendous illusion concocted by those that seem to know what's going on in order to bolster their feelings of misery, disenfranchisement, and confusion among those who don't have a clue, lies of, oh, whoop, lost here, <sighs> lies about the future and lies about the past, lies about who we can and can't be or what we can and can't do, lies about who we can and can't love, lies about what we can and can't think. They are trying to keep us away from the very happy happiness. Haha, <laughs> I'm going to try that one again. They are trying to keep us away from the very happiness they promise, promised us in all those unskippable advertisements, friends. Let's do third time's a charm on that one. Just, I mean, we're not keeping score here, but I just want to get it out because I couldn't speak that stupid sentence. Um, they are trying to keep us away from the very happiness they promised us in all of those unskippable advertisements, friends. These lies that our parents and teachers and priests and best friends inadvertently and innocently, <laughs> inadvertently and innocently perpetuated to make us 
and themselves, feel better about the starkly unpredictable and monumentally disappointing world we have found ourselves in. Little lies, white lies, consistent lies, lies all the same. Lies to make them feel like you might have a chance to take hold of something they couldn't. Lies to make you feel like the way you have been living your life isn't as messy and blemished as the way others have lived or are living. These lies have created a social construct of digital avatars that we perceive as other people, but are only carefully presented and artfully edited versions of the whole story. These lies and acts of obfuscation search as, serve as a way for us to feel sorry for and about ourselves and each other as if we have some reason to be distressed about the lives we ourselves chose and choose to live. These lies mold us and shape us without our consent, without our acknowledgement, and without our cognizance. We integrate them into our own view of the world without knowing that they are lies. We're going to end there. So that's normal on trial. That's part of the preamble. Uh, there's a lot to that story. There's a lot in that book. <laughs> um, right now it's like 158 pages, I believe, is the current count. Um, it's going to be much, much longer than that. I mean, I'm anticipating the 700 page range, but please don't quote me on that because, man, um, the outline isn't even finished yet. So I'm excited to be writing again. And I hope that um, going through this hour of uh, material um, can be an inspiration to young authors that are trying to maybe reconnect with their career. Um, maybe some older authors that are trying to get into the new worldview that we have found ourselves in, um, people trying to break into the digital media sphere. Um, and of course, I'm trying to improve my own skills and uh, just reach out for a network of other authors that are kind of doing the same thing that I am. So um, let's see what else is on my schedule. Uh, let's talk about things that I want to do again. Um, I do want to continue reading on camera, on stream. Um, I'd like to do it regularly, so if anyone does get a chance to listen to this whole thing, I'm probably going to cut it right at an hour. Um, maybe an hour feels good, maybe 90, 90 minutes will feel good, maybe two hours will feel good eventually, but I feel like this one is going to naturally and organically conclude. Uh, at, at about the hour mark and that seems to be a really comfortable amount of time for me to talk continuously um, and make probably amusing f facial expressions at the camera or slightly off camera so I'll try to make more direct eye contact but I do have a lot going on on the screen and my phone is blowing up right now so I'm assuming that um, a lot of people are engaging with the content. It's also 5 p.m. on a Friday, so a lot of people are just trying to get a hold of me in general. Um, so uh, tentatively, I'm thinking about streaming on um, Thursdays and Saturdays, um, writing on Thursdays and audiobooks on Saturdays. But that could change. You know, none of this is set in stone. I'm really just kind of looking for some type of digital content to start creating. Um, that's a little bit more about my own work um, because I've been doing a lot of work for other people these last few years and that's kind of why Normal on Trial has been on the back burner but we're going to go ahead and take it from the back burner and bring it on into the front burner um, of the metaphorical stove range top. So I guess what I want to leave you with is this little ditty here that I wrote to answer the thesis question of the video that we have found ourselves watching all the way through. So if the question is why publish a book in 2022, I think that begs the question, why write a book at all? Why make art? Why take the hard road? Why do anything? For the people that need to hear the message. That's why we write. We write for the people who are gonna read it and who are going to be changed by what we wrote. That's the only reason we do this. And everything else is a matter of technique 
and advertising. The way you express your original thought is a matter of media and genre and your capabilities and your palette and who you're capable of stealing from and getting away with it. <laughs> so um, I guess in conclusion, happy Friday. Um, I am Zach Elmblad. I am the owner of Elmblad Media Group. I am the author of three books and a smoking hot manuscript soon to be hitting bookshelves near you at some point. Um, and also a content creator of a wide variety of different types of media. Uh, you can check me out on Instagram at Elmblad underscore media underscore group or just my personal one, which is at Zach Elmblad. Um, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and all that stupid crap, and I hardly check it at all. So if you follow me, um, <laughs> say hi when I'm there. But I, I don't, I don't do that too much these days. But hopefully, we'll be changing that shortly with this little web program. So um, yeah, coming from Elmblad Media Group Studios. I want to shout out to Garrett Shelke and the Garrett Shelke podcast. Um, he's kind of the one who has inspired me to continue moving forward with the general thing that we've got going on here. And um, we're going to sign off at that point. Have a good one.